Hello, I'm Hugh Turberville, editor of the Cricketer magazine, and with me today I have the distinguished cricket writer Paul Edwards. You can read his articles in the Cricketer magazine and at thecricketer.com on our digital channels. Hi, Paul. Hi, Hugh. How are you? Fine, thanks. And we're here to talk about the sad passing of England's greatest spin bowler, Derek Underwood. Sad news, Paul. Sad indeed. I was in the press box at Trent Bridge and I was a little bit head down over a piece, which was rather strange given that the today's play was going to be abandoned, but nonetheless. And I heard the number 297 and I, like many other cricket supporters and lovers, have these magic numbers in our heads that have a, carry a greater significance because of their cricketing associations. And I heard 297, I thought, oh, yes, that, that means something. Hang on. Um, and then someone just turned to me, if it was Frank Watson of BBC Harrison Worcester, and said Derek Underwood had died. And immediately a, a host of memories flooded back, many of them from my childhood, because, of course, I saw Underwood bowl on a number of occasions. Yeah, well, um, unfortunately, I didn't see him in the, in the flesh. But what I know of him, I'll, I'll talk about at the end. But um, so, what are your main what are, what are your main memories of? of, of well, him? the main memory, is, the main memory is is, I think the, perhaps the great one of the greatest pieces of luck that has come my way um, in in my life. And I want to take it. I'd have to take you back to the summer of nineteen sixty seven because I lived then very close to the ground at Trafalgar Road in Southport, which was then one of Lancashire's outgrounds and still is. And in June, the game against the Indian tourists was couldn't be played at Old Trafford. Surprisingly, Manchester was waterlogged. Hmm. And the game was transferred to Southport, where they had three days uninterrupted cricket. And I watched um, Bish and Bailey bowl at Southport in June. And then, to come on to the, the main subject of our chat, the following month, Kent were the, the visitors, and I saw Underwood bowl against Lancashire, and his figures were, match figures, were 8 for 111 in 68.5 overs. So at, at that time, both players, both Beatty and Underwood, had played two tests. They were well-known cricketers, but they weren't famous, I don't think. Beatty was going to play in all three tests of that summer series. Five days after the game at Southport, he was playing against uh, England in the test match at Headingley. But I saw Underwood bowl and I saw him again. Uh, I don't. I didn't see. He was there in seventy one. I didn't see that. And then I saw the game in seventy six, um, and I saw him at Manchester on many occasions. But to see Underwood and Beatty within the space of a month uh, is more luck than anyone deserves. I think. My friend talks about going to Chelmsford and and uh, watching Essex v Kent in the in the John Player League and watching the the double act that was Underwood and um, Alan Knott. Yeah, uh, and just uh, the the sheer. I mean, he talks about the sheer sort of the speed at which Knott's gloves hit the stumps, um, you know, with the ball. But um, I suppose it must have been. I mean, uh, people talk about Underwood's pace, don't they? I mean, they, he's you know, yeah. described the slow bowler, but really he was in in many ways a medium pacer, wasn't he? He was, he was absolutely, and I, I tell people today that if Underwood bowled in, say Premier League cricket, he'd be regarded as something of a third seamer and, mm -hmm. and a very and a devastating one. Um, I, th I think you, you raise two points. The one that the one advantage of watching Underwood bowl on an outground is that you were closer to it, and I was there for the whole of the uh, Kent game. I think certainly for one of those days, and probably two. I was meant to be at school, but never mind. The, and you're, you're, about, you're about 60 yards away and you can see and you can hear the players. There's not as much chirp. There wasn't as much chirp then as, as there is, but you can hear the players and you have that intimacy with them that they like. 
And the linkage, the connection between Underwood and Knott was phenomenal. Knott always used, or Knott says, that he knew when Underwood was going to say fire one down the leg side in the hope of a stumping, or when he thought that Underwood would bowl slightly slower. And the uh, so there was that linkage between the two. And you're absolutely correct about the speed of Knott's gloves. I mean, I was a child. I don't want to claim um, a knowledge I didn't possess. But it was clear to me that even then that, that, that I didn't possess at that time. But it was clear to me then that this was a magnificent relationship between bowler and wicketkeeper. And I don't think either we should forget the fact that in that that Kent had some terrific close fielders at that time who worked with, as it were, Underwood and not. Um, and I, I, I was thinking Colin Cowdery was playing in that game in 67 and would have been fielding at slip. You had um, Brian Luckhurst as well. Um, and uh, in, we would have fielded close in. And these were incredibly good close fielders as well. And to have to face Underwood, who you're quite correct in your, in your analysis, that the, his, his bowling was of medium pace and wasn't often spin. It was it, he used to cut the ball as well. Mm. Um, to face Underwood on a on a on a wearing out ground wicket were, must have been the most delicious torture. I would have mm. thought. Yeah, I mean, I was just reading up about him before. I mean, I, I wonder how um, another famous cutter bowler, sort of medium, medium fast, Alec Bedza. I wonder um, what the speed difference between those two was. But uh, probably Alec, Alec would have got annoyed about that analogy. But um, I just reading. Yeah, I mean, he, he got eight, eight for nine at Hastings. It's a spell of eight wickets for nine runs at Hastings. Um, Underwood and 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 you talked about that number two nine seven. And of course, you're right. You know, we all know the numbers like four oh five and all that sort of thing. But yeah. His number of first class wickets, two, four, six, five. I know, I know. It's it, it's absurd. Everyone everyone went into rhapsodies when when Jimmy Anderson got to a thousand, and rightly so. It's a different. Yeah. The game is organised differently, and and there are fewer and there are fewer matches now. But two and a half thousand, and when you consider that even that is something something like a couple of thousand light on Wilfred Rhodes. Or, or or a thousand light on um, something like that on Charlie Parker, the Gloucester slow left armour, um, who was another great bowler and a, a sort of unsung hero. Um, but the the thing about Underwood was this sort of the way he he, he sort of trotted and trotted in. There was a rhythm to his um, his bowling, but no one would call him. And he, he himself said, "I'm not an athlete." Um, and then he would. When he took a wicket, he would he, we would clap the the fielder or clap the dismissal, and um, trot down the trot this flat footed trot down the wicket of delight. I always remember, and I've used this at least one occasion recently, that um, some players were watching Underwood towards the end of his career in a match on television, and one of them said. Look at look at Deadly, he said. He he's still as delighted when he takes a wicket and he's taken over two thousand of them. And one of the shrewder observers turned and said, Yeah, he said, that's probably why he's taken over two thousand. Because he still got that joy mm. out of playing the game. Mm. And it was extraordinary, extraordinary to watch him. Um, the other point you make about the 297, and this is something that I haven't uh, read in the obituaries. People say he would have taken more test wickets if he had um, not gone to Packer, if he had not gone on the Rebel Tour to South Africa. Hell's bells, he would have taken more test wickets if he'd been picked for all the tests for which he was available. Because mm. there were many tests when they preferred... Other fine spin bowlers. I mean, this was a, an age in which every team had at least one and probably two good spinners because they needed them. You, you, there was Norman Gifford. There was Robin Hobbs. There was Pat Pocock, all of whom were preferred to um, Underwood 
on a number of occasions. I mean, I'm after 1967, I saw my first test at Old Trafford in 68 when Pocock was playing for England. And it wasn't. In, and then, the, in, of course, in the last test, Underwood became a national figure when when he took those wickets on a on a drying a drying pitch at the Oval against mm. Australia, and and suddenly was catapulted um, catapulted to fame. But um, no, you're absolutely right. The figures are extraordinary, and and Underwood said he was he, he wasn't an athlete. It was it was an age when um, when when weights were things that professional cricketers had to endure at bus stops, really. Well. And he, 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 he wasn't an athlete at all. But he took 2,500 first-class wickets and 297 in tests. So, so how athletic do you want him to be, frankly? Yeah, I think well, the thing, nice thing about cricket and possibly golf is that non-athletes can do quite well, can't they? Um, no, I don't. Yeah, I, was, I mean, you, I look, taking up your point, um, he made his debut in '66, ended in '82. That's 16 years, 10 tests a, a year. That's 160 tests. So you know, and he and he played in what 86 of them. So yeah, you're, you're right. He um he he could have played a lot more. I've been watching him on YouTube in the 1972 Ashes, the year I was born, in tandem with Ray yeah. Illingworth. So so that that was enjoyable. But I think a nice way of ending. I mean, was elaborating on that that, that joy that. Uh, uh, that he seemed to get from cricket, and he hasn't been well last few years. Has he? We, we have we've bumped into him at a few memorial services and things, but um, we'll always retain the memories of seeing that joyful figure on the field, won't we? You absolutely do, and I make no apology for for saying that when when I heard of his um, passing, and I, I like knew you knew that he had not been well. One's childhood tumbles out, and all the memories of the first time that you, um, I, I saw my first first class game in '65, but all your memories of the game and of the joy you took from it, and from the shared joy, I think that you, the the, the joy that was shared between players and spectators, um, who were who were watching and playing. Uh, this extraordinary uh, game and doing so for for with enormous enjoyment. Uh, you're absolutely right. The uh, and the the sense of um, the commun. I'm going to say communion then, which is over the over the top. But the combination of not keeping to Underwood's bowling. And Lancashire's batsmen trying to cope with it. Those images are from 1967. Will stay with me for the rest of my life, and um, perhaps, perhaps, I could end with um, some something from my a cricket writer for whom I have a particular fondness, um, Alan Ross, who, when he was writing about the Sussex team of the 1930s called them his, his first his first gods and his last gods and in many respects although I was born in Sussex um, players like Underwood um, were, were my first gods and and they'll be my last Paul thanks very much for sharing your memories of uh, Derek Underwood absolutely my pleasure